Okay, here we are. Understanding your religion, the seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith. This is lesson 14 in the series, so we're going you know, two quarters to do this. Today we're studying the sub-doctrine of adoption, becoming the children of God. So we're studying the major doctrines of the Bible. I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning because we take up half the lesson to do the review. I think you, most of you, you know, have been in this class for a while now. So we've been studying the fifth you know, major doctrine of the Bible, which is the doctrine of reconciliation, where the Bible is teaching how God reconciles man back to himself. And I'll give you a summary statement of what that doctrine teaches. It says basically, God in His mercy devised a plan in order to reconcile man back to himself, and this plan is a process of reconciliation and it is explained in the Bible using 10 sub-doctrines. And so far we have studied five of those sub-doctrines. The first of the, so remember, you've got the five major ones, and then the fifth major one is the one of reconciliation, and under that fifth major doctrine, there are 10 sub-doctrines that explain that fifth, okay? So of the 10, that explain that fifth major doctrine. The first of these sub-doctrines is the doctrine or the teaching of election. And it basically teaches that God chooses Christ. That's the only choice God makes. He chooses Christ to be the one to complete His plan. Second major, uh, excuse me, second sub-doctrine is predestination. God knows that His choice of Christ will succeed in reconciling men back to Himself. That's what the doctrine of predestination teaches. Not that one is going to be saved and one is going to be lost, that's not correct. It's that God knows in advance, because He is God, that His plan will succeed. Third sub-doctrine, the doctrine of atonement. And that doctrine teaches that God pays the moral debt that man owes for sin, and He pays this moral debt through the death of Christ on the cross. That's the doctrine of atonement, the doctrine or sub-doctrine of redemption, explains that God frees man because the debt for sin is paid. So the doctrine of atonement is the how. How does God you know, pay for the sins of mankind? Well, through the atonement, Jesus pays that moral debt. And what's the result of that atonement? Well, the result is redemption, freedom. Man is free now, the debt's been paid. And that doctrine is explained in what we call the doctrine of redemption. Then the fifth sub-doctrine is the one uh, called regeneration. Uh, the debt is paid, man is therefore freed. And he's free to what? Well, he's now free to live a new life. He's freed from sin, freed from condemnation. He will not be condemned. God is not going to judge him and condemn him because he's an imperfect creature. Rather, man is now a new man, you know, this born again idea, that's, that's whenever somebody's talking about born again, what they're talking about technically is the doctrine of regeneration. Now, here's, we're going to make a turn here, okay? We're going to shift gears. So I really want you to, to zone into what I'm going to say. These five sub-doctrines, when you take them together, this is God's plan of salvation. You know, you've heard preaching your whole life, people say, you know, we're going to preach the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. Well, God's plan of salvation is explained in these five sub-doctrines. Now, some people say, well, what about, you know, believe, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. You know, I thought that was the plan of salvation. No, that's not the plan of salvation. I, I know you're thinking, what? I've been hearing that all my life. I'm saying yes, it was sincerely taught, it's just incorrect, that's all. Our faith, our repentance, our confession of Jesus, our baptism, this is not the plan of salvation. These things, you know, faith, repentance, confession, baptism, these are man's response to God's plan of salvation. So you're saying, well, you know, you're splitting hairs, you know, semantics. Well, yeah, it is semantics. It is a question of what words mean, but it's important. You know, I've said before, people say, well, I, I was sharing my faith with somebody 
and I, and I shared with them the plan of salvation. And I said, oh yeah, well, what did you share? What did you say to them? They said, well, I told them you know, that you need to confess Christ, and you need to believe Christ, and then you need to repent, and you need to be baptized, you know, and you'll be saved. And I shared with them the plan of salvation. I said, well, and they didn't respond. And I said, okay. I said, you know why they didn't respond? Why? Because you didn't share with them the plan of salvation. <laughs> That's the response to the plan. The plan is God decided to save you because of His grace and He sent Jesus to die for you and pay for your sins and because your sins are paid for, you're now free and you're forgiven. And all the dumb, stupid, mean, foolish, evil things that you've done have been forgiven you. That's the plan of salvation. That's the good news. Wow, good news. And, and all of that is available to everybody. Men, women, black, white, poor, rich, smart, stupid. You know, everybody is eligible for that gift of salvation. That's good news. Maybe in the USA in 2015 that you know, we might not see that because you know, every, the American dream and all that kind of stuff. You know big middle class, but if you were back in the days of Jesus, where a third of the population of the world was in slavery, that was great news. You mean me, a slave? I can be free? I can be a child? You, know, you see what I'm saying? So many people confuse the two when trying to preach the gospel to someone. So we need to remember the true context for biblical information when sharing with another person. The story of the gospel. What is the story of the gospel? Well, this is the actual historical story of Jesus. His life, His ministry, His death, His burial, His resurrection. That's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, one to five. You know, people say, they think that's the gospel. Well, yeah, it is the gospel. You know, when you give facts and figures, 2,000 years ago, Jesus lived, and He did this, and He did that, and He did miracles, and so on and so forth. You know? Well, people need these basic facts in order to establish the true object of their faith, which is Jesus, and witness for the power of God, the fact that He rose from the dead. They need that information. That's why we have Bible class. That's why we have babies in class learning about the creation and learning about the, you know, the books of the Bible, and then we have you know, middle school and teenagers, and we're teaching them, and then we have these adult classes. You know. We're uploading all of the information, the facts, about the Bible, the history, who are the characters, what, what is, what, who are the prophets, what did that mean? You know, we're learning. So that's the story of the gospel. We just need all the information about it. Then you have the meaning of the gospel. And that's, where, that's what this class is. This is, the, this is a theology class. Okay? Remember I told you you're learning a language, redemption, adoption. You know? You're learning the language of theology in this class. So the meaning of the gospel, this is God's plan to reconcile man back to himself through Jesus. You know, that's the meaning of the gospel. So the meaning behind the gospel story is laid out in the doctrines or the teachings that explain the gospel message. And these doctrines explain why Jesus came, what He accomplished, how we are affected. Notice that in this class, We've hardly talked about the miracles of Jesus and what He did and who His parents were. And you know, we don't, why? Well, because that's the story of the gospel and this class is not about that. This class is about the meaning of the gospel. I'm assuming that the people that take this class, they already know the story. I don't have to teach you about Joseph and Mary and Bethlehem and all that stuff. You already know it. And then you have the response to the gospel. So God requires man to respond to him, to Jesus, to respond to the good news. You know, it's like God is saying, hey you, yes you, I'm not talking to a wall, pay attention to me. And this response to the gospel is described in terms of faith. You know when they say we're saved through grace by faith, what do they mean by faith? Well, how do we express faith in a way that is acceptable to God? Well, the Bible teaches us that 
insofar as salvation is concerned, the proper way to respond to God, the way we express our faith, is we acknowledge our belief. That's one response. We repent of our sins. We recognize, yes, I'm a sinner, I'm imperfect. And because I believe now, that's going to change in my life. I'm, I'm not simply going to sin and not care about it. Now I'm going to care about what is right, what is good. You know, I'm, I, this is going to become a priority for me. And baptism, that moment in history where I go from being a non-believer to a believer, saved to, uh, unsaved to saved, uh, not a disciple to being a disciple, and all of that business. So, all of that is the response to the gospel. And my little mantra here that I keep talking about is that unfortunately many times we talk so much about the C part, you know, the response to the gospel, but we ignore talking about the B part. And we have to do all of it. I'm not saying one is not important. They're all important, but what I'm saying is we have to teach people the story, the meaning, and the response. Okay? All right, so let's get back to our first five sub-doctrines. I've said that these first five doctrines explain what God has done. This is His plan, to save and reconcile mankind to Himself. Now, the next five sub-doctrines, again, I'm shifting gears. This is where the gear shift is coming. The next five sub-doctrines are interesting in that they do not add more information about reconciliation. You know, the main, that fifth main sub-doctrine, and I said I've got five underneath. The next five down, they don't add any more information to that fifth major doctrine. The five sub-doctrines that we're going to study next um, uh, explain God's reconciliation from five different perspectives. Understand? So the first five sub-doctrines explain reconciliation. The next five sub-doctrines look at reconciliation from different perspectives. Okay? So for example, there are five, you know, five more, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I've just written them, you know, one, two, three, four, five here, the next five. So the, the first of these five sub-doctrines you know, to come um, is the doctrine of adoption. Well, the doctrine of adoption doesn't explain more about reconciliation. It simply looks at this plan from a human perspective. Then the doctrine or the sub-doctrine of justification, it looks at God's plan from a legal perspective. The sub-doctrine of perfection, it looks at God's plan from a heavenly perspective. The sub-doctrine of sanctification looks at God's plan from an inward perspective and the fifth or you know, the last of the sub-doctrines, the doctrine, uh, sub-doctrine of salvation, it looks at God's plan from an eschatological perspective. When I say eschatological, I mean the result, the final result at the end, when all of this is done, where do you end up? So today, we're going to start with the sub-doctrine of adoption and look at God's plan of salvation from a human perspective. All right, so let's look at Old Testament ideas about adoption. The main idea or image of adoption in the Old Testament expressed in God's adoption, is expressed rather in God's adoption of Israel as His special child. In Exodus 4.22 it says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, this is you know, God talking to Moses, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So you see the imagery there? So when we examine the relationship that people have with God in the Bible, we see that only Jesus shares God's divine nature as the Son of God. Only Jesus is referred to as you know, the only begotten. Doesn't mean that He created Jesus. It means Jesus is the only one that has a nature like that, the only begotten. He's the only one that has a divine nature. God has other sons and daughters but there's only one that has his divine nature. That's why it says the only begotten. In describing the subdoctrine of atonement and explaining the genealogy of Jesus, I said that God chose you know, Abraham and the descendants, the Jews, to be his adopted sons. And he did this for these people so his only begotten son, Jesus, would have a physical and cultural heritage to identify him 
when he entered the stage of human history in order to complete his work. So, okay, God is deciding, I'm going to come among humanity. God is going to become man, okay? Well, what kind of man is he going to be? If God is going to put on human flesh, what kind of human is he going to be? Is he going to be Polish? You know, is he going to be a Ukrainian? Is he going to be an American? Well, of course, these, these cultures didn't exist back then, but you know what I'm saying. You know, what kind of, what nationality is this God-man going to be? So what he does is, well, I'm not going to pick any existing nationality, I'm going to create a nationality. So he picks a, a Mesopotamian, Abraham, that's what he was, that's the culture he came from, a Mesopotamian. And he says to Abraham, you know, Abraham, I'm going to make a people out of you. So I want you to leave your home and go to this place where you've never been, you know, the land of Canaan, modern Israel. And you're going to settle there and I'm going to make a people out of you. And, we, and that's what the Old Testament is about. How God takes one person and out of that one person creates an entire nation, gives that nation a culture, a religion, rules, laws, history, Worship, you know, he just creates this entire culture whose only purpose is to provide a cultural setting, a historical stage upon which Jesus will enter. He's going to clothe himself with the Jewish culture. That's who he's going to be. So if you're wondering, what's the Old Testament? What's that about? It's simply the history of how God took one person and made an entire culture a nation out of these people in order to prepare humanity for the coming of Jesus. So um, that's the idea of um, adoption in the Old Testament. God adopts Israel as His child. Now in the New Testament, the idea of adoption to describe God's plan for reconciliation appears only in the writings of Paul the Apostle. He writes about adoption, but he doesn't write about adoption from a, a Jewish perspective. He writes about adoption from a Greek and Roman perspective, uh, how they did it in that culture, because he was a, a Roman citizen by birth, but he was a Jew by culture. So we better understand Paul's point in his description of reconciliation from the perspective of adoption if we're familiar with Greek and Roman adoption practices. It'll give us insight into what he's talking about when he talks about how God adopts us as his children. So the basic definition of adoption at the time, it was a legal process by which a man might bring into his family and endow with privileges of a son, someone who was not by nature his son or kindred. So some of the social and legal perspectives and customs. First of all, in Roman and Greek societies, the father had absolute legal power over his children as well as his slaves, his wives, and his property. It was all his. Okay. Secondly, Adoption was not considered a benevolent act as it is today. You, know, you hear about a friend of yours or someone, they adopt a child and what's your first reaction? Oh, that's so good, you're good. You know, I'm, I'm not making fun now. You know, you're thinking, boy, I don't know how, I don't know how you, I, I don't know if I could do that. You know what I'm saying? But we admire people you know, who take in children, who adopt children. We feel what a, what a wonderful Christian thing to do. But in the Greek and Roman world, there was no benevolence attached to adopting. Girls, for example, were rarely adopted. Adoptions were done primarily to continue the family line. At times, an adult male was actually adopted while his natural parents were alive in order to fulfill a son's role in some other family. Another family had only girls. They wanted a, a boy to continue the family line, so they'd adopt a, an adult from another family to, to come in. Okay? Um, when a male child was adopted, however, he was considered a full son and enjoyed equal rights and privileges of natural sons. And then Roman custom called for a public transaction, a, a legal ceremony to take place in order for an adoption to be complete. 
and in the case of a child taken out of one family into another, this ceremony signaled the severing of ties with one family and the adoption into the other family. And as far as the natural family giving up a child in this way, the ceremony was the point where they ceased having any relationship at all with that child. It's as if that child, you know, as far as they were concerned, he was dead and would never return to them. There wasn't this business, know your birth father or mother, you don't get to know them, you know, maintain a relationship, that's today. But back in those days, if you went from one family to another, your natural family, that was it, you never saw them again. And so when the Apostle Paul describes God's plan to reconcile man to himself, he compares this to an adoption process, a very human experience that his readers at the time could easily understand and relate to. So there are several passages where Paul explains God's plan using the image of adoption. In Ephesians 1.5, for example, it says, He predestined us to adoption. Oh, there's that word, predestination. What, what does that mean? Well, it means God knew in advance what was going to happen. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. So here Paul explains in human terms the end result of God's plan. Once the plan of salvation is complete, what happens? Well, he's saying what happens is we've become adopted sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. So those separated from Him by sin would ultimately become His children, His sons and daughters again. How? Through this process of reconciliation and adoption. So the end result of His plan was that He would be reconciled as a son or a daughter of God. You see what I'm saying? You understand? So the next five sub-doctrines I'm explaining to you explain the process of salvation from different perspectives. So Paul here is describing the process of reconciliation in terms of adoption. Okay? He's using that imagery. Another passage, Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, it says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified, whoop, there's that justification, made right, okay, by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ, oh, there's adoption, sons of God, okay. Through faith in Jesus Christ, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Remember I said to you there was a public ceremony when someone was adopted and went from one family to another? In Christianity, there's a public ceremony that happens when you become adopted child of God. And what is that ceremony? Well, he just said it. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You go from being, you're not a child of God to a child of God. What's the public ceremony? Well, for us, it's, it's baptism. So in this passage, Paul explains the relationship between God's plan and its results. And he makes this by making a comparison between two types of slavery. Now in those days, one could be a slave to a master who gave you no rights or freedoms until you could somehow purchase your freedom or be adopted by your master as a son. This happened not very often, but it did happen at times. So that's one form of slavery. On the other hand, you could be a young son in the family, and as such you would be like a slave, completely under your father's role and rule, until at his discretion you were released through a formal transaction and you became legally independent. Today we become legally independent how? We get a job, right? We get a job and we move out. <laughs> in those days you couldn't do that. You didn't tell your father, you know, hey, I'm out of here. I, you know, I'm tired of living under your rules. You know, that gets you killed. You know what I'm saying? You, that did not happen in that society. Your father is the one who finally said, okay, you're, you're, you're eligible for your inheritance. You know, you're a fully uh, mature son. You're free and so on and so forth. So the point that Paul makes in this passage is that both the child and the slave they both long for the time that 
they can be free to enjoy the privileges of an adult son. The apostle says that it is this desire in people to be sons and daughters of the Father, God, that God responds to with His plan of reconciliation. So no matter who you are, slave, free, male, female, Jew, Greek, the end result is that you share the same sonship and adoption through the reconcil reconciling work of Jesus. So this passage didn't mean that these people no longer had their sexual or cultural identities and roles. It explained that their relationship with God had changed. I mean, there are a lot of people that, you know, they use this passage here to do all kinds of things that are not meant, you know? He says there's neither Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And people jump on this passage and they say, all right, you know, it means that women and men, we do all the same things in church and the, you know, no. That's, that's just bad Bible exposition. That's taking a passage out of context and you know, doing with it what you want. Here Paul is talking about salvation. He's not talking about the roles of men and women in ministry. He's simply saying that everybody, men, women, slaves, free, Jews, Greek, everybody gets the same thing. They all get to be sons and daughters of Christ. They don't stop being slaves if they're slaves. If you're a slave in first century Rome and you become a Christian, well that's wonderful. You've become a Christian but you're still a slave or you're still a man, or you're still a woman, or you're, you understand what I'm saying? You're still rich, or you're still poor, whatever. You know, that status remains. What has changed is your spiritual status with God. Okay, don't want to go too long on that. Yeah, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he's the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world, let's see. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, under the law. You see, that's the story of the gospel. See what I'm saying? He's assuming that his readers, they know the story of the gospel. So he just kind of refers to it in passing. You know, uh, fullness of time, you know, God sent forth, you know, born of a woman, that's all he says. He assumes the people who are reading this know that that woman was Mary and you know, the angel Gabriel visited her and so on and so forth. He, he doesn't go into details, he, he assumes they know the story. So he's not explaining the story here, he's explaining the meaning behind the story. Okay? So you know, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might uh, redeem, there's redemption. The theory, of the th the theological idea of redemption was that he might, you could switch the word redeem, take redeem out, and you could put the word free. He would free those who were under the law that he might receive adoption as sons. What does he mean? They were under the law, they were imprisoned? Well, it means that the law was condemning them. You sinned. You sinned, and the penalty for sin is death, separation from God. That's what it means to be under the law. And you say to the law, but I'm doing my best, I'm trying, I don't like to sin, I'd rather be a good person, blah, 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 but it doesn't matter. The law, there's no grace in the law. The law says, you sin, you die. You're, you're, you're driving down the street, right? And, and, and you're driving and you're just not paying, you're listening to the news about something and you're 11 miles over the speed limit. You know, the cop pulls you over. There was nobody on the street, it was quiet, there's no traffic, no pedestrians, nothing. And you say to the cop, but officer, you know, I, I, there's nobody around, nobody was endangered, I, I, wasn't, I didn't mean to go over the speed limit, I, I just happened to be listening to the radio, you know, and what's the cop going to say <laughs> as he's handing you the ticket? Have a nice day. Why? There's no grace in the law. There's no grace in the law. You wrote the speed limit, you get the ticket, that's it. You sin, you break God's law, you're condemned. No grace in the law. But here, you see what I'm saying? Let's read this passage over again now that you understand that idea. But when the fullness of time, at the right time, God sent His Son, God became man, we talked about that, right? Born of a woman under the law, 
you sin, you die, that's the rule, so that He might redeem, free those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Does it make more sense now? He pays my, for my sins on the cross. He pays my ticket off. I'm free. I believe in Him. I do that public transformation. Believe and repent. I respond to Him in faith and baptism. And now, what's become of me? I've become now a son of God. Not an enemy of God, a son, a daughter of God. And so he explains this idea in terms of adoption, okay? Uh, it's, okay, that's just more of the same. Uh, so, the doctrine of adoption. Reconcile the sons and daughters because all desire somehow to be sons and daughters of God. All right, Romans 8, I need to move quickly, we're out of time almost. It says, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Again, fear of what? Well, fear of condemnation. I'm going to die, I'm going to be condemned. But you have received the spirit of oh, adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And we know that Abba is that term that means daddy. You know, it's a kind of a familiar, a familiar term, not a formal term. So it says, we cry out, Daddy, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. This is Paul explaining a theological idea, reconciliation, using human imagery, the human imagery of adoption. That's the point, uh, that's the point that we're making here. So those who become God's sons and daughters through His plan resulting in adoption know and are sure of their new status because they have been legitimized in several ways. They've been sealed, if you wish, with God's Holy Spirit. Let me see if I got that. Let's see, right there, okay. Um, they have been sealed with God's Holy Spirit. We know about that in Acts 2.38. They call upon God as their own personal father, that's what Paul is talking about, and they're like God's natural son, Jesus, in that they share his past, suffering and death, and they share his future, resurrection and glory. Let's see if we can get to Romans, eight, Romans 9, verse four. Okay, so he says, he talks about Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises. So Paul here refers to the fact that this has always been the end purpose of God to adopt sinners as sons and daughters. He explains that it was first promised to the Jews, but they refused his plan you know, of being, reconciling, being reconciled to God through Christ. They refused, it. that's the problem with the Jewish nation. In the purpose for which they were created, to, create, to, to provide you know, a human stage upon which the Christ would come. That was the purpose that they were created. Well, what happens? They rejected the purpose for which they were created. They rejected Christ. You know, he was a Jew and they rejected him. So Paul is saying, you know, God wanted to give this privilege to the Jews that they be sons and daughters of his. And they rejected it. And so now he offers it to everybody else. All of us can you know, take advantage of that, of that promise. And that's still true today, right? You know, today, Jewish people think, the religious ones anyways, they think that they receive this adoption through culture and genealogy. They think, you know, well, because I'm a Jew, I'm already a son of God, without reference to the reconciliation. That's the, that's the religious error that they make. So in the end, God's plan permits lost children to be adopted by a loving father. Okay, so let's kind of summarize the information that we've got so far, okay? The doctrines of original goodness and the fall explain how mankind has become lost and helpless, orphans separated from God. The doctrine of reconciliation has 10 sub-doctrines and the first five of these explain God's plan to remove the sin that separates mankind from Himself. And then the sixth sub-doctrine explains that one result of this plan is that sinful mankind has been adopted by God to be His children. 
Okay, one last point about adoption in the first century. In the Roman era, children who were deformed or ill or adult candidates for adoption who were convicted of crimes, these people were unadoptable, never adopted. Even, even to this day, I mean, you know, handicapped children and so on and so forth, sometimes mixed race children, they don't usually get adopted first. Still that taboo, you know. But in the, in the time of, of Christ, you know, in the New Testament era, <laughs> I mean, the, they were never adopted, ever, okay? Well, in the same way, we were unadoptable by God because of our sinfulness and our imperfection. Uh, the imperfect cannot become a member of the perfect family. And so before our adoption could be completed, our imperfections caused by sin, our condemnation as guilty sinners, this had to be set aside and this was done through God's plan. It's as if you choose a child who's ill and before you adopt them, you heal them of their illness or their handicap, if that would be possible. This is what God has done with us. He's healed us of our handicap and our handicap is you know, imperfection. So how does he do this? He chooses Christ to accomplish his plan, that's election. He knows that Jesus will succeed in the plan, that's predestination. He knows that God is going to pay the debt for all of our sins forever, that's atonement. Once our debts are paid, we are free from condemnation, that is redemption. And now that we are free, God gives us a new life to live. That's regeneration. And once we are free and alive, we're qualified to become part of God's family. That's the doctrine of atonement. So the adopted child in the Roman world, he had a new home, a new family, and a lifestyle and a future. Well, in the same way, the child adopted by God has a new status as a child of God, Galatians 3.26, has the Holy Spirit within him, Acts 2.38, that's the new home, has fellowship with other godly children. So you know, in the Roman adoption, there was a new family. In the spiritual adoption, we also have a new family, it's called the church. In a Roman adoption, the adoptee had a new lifestyle. In the spiritual adoption, our lifestyle is holiness. You know, why do we live the way we do? Why do we avoid you know, whatever, you know, abusing substances and whatever? You know? Why do we avoid that? We're trying to be better than other people? No. God has called us to live holy lives. We pursue holiness. That's, that's it. We pursue holiness on purpose. On purpose. We do it on purpose, not by accident. I want to live a holy life. Why? because I want to honor my Father who is, who is God. Not because I'm trying to make somebody else feel bad who's not a Christian, or you know, I'm not trying to be, quote, holier than thou, some other person, that's not the point. I'm trying to please my Father, and what pleases my Father is that I live a holy life. That's the purpose of it. And then, of course, in a Roman adoption, there's a new future for this child. In a spiritual adoption, there is an inheritance and a wealth which is indestructible and beyond worldly value, Ephesians 1.3. So, last slide. If I'm going to summarize the first six sub-doctrines, do it in 10 words. God promised that Christ's atonement would produce legitimate spiritual children. All right. I think we brought it in under the bell.